Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we're going to begin or continue our study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith um, in our study of A.T. Jones' uh, 1893 General Conference Bulletin Sermons. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have through thy spirit and for the time that we can have studying together and the blessing, the promise that you are there with us in our midst and for the rest that we can have in Christ. We pray, Lord, for each person. We ask for your Holy Spirit to bring that conviction upon us and the power to overcome sin. We pray, Lord, that as we continue this study, uh, that we will see things that we have never seen before and things that we have seen, that we'll understand them much more deeply. Be with us now as we read and study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again and happy Sabbath. Now, uh, the study of A.T. Jones, I mean, A.T. Jones takes his time, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that, but now we're taking A.T. Jones and we're taking our time with him, and that takes quite a while. Um, but I think these are very important points that he brings up. And what we have done so far is we've noticed that in 1888, A.T. Jones had um, spoken against the Blair Bill, which was a Sunday law bill and managed to um, thwart the purposes there. And he became a bit of a hero within Adventism. But it was also at the time that he was presenting the 1888 message at the General Conference. So, or it was after that, the General Conference was after that. And here we are five years later in 1893. And Jones has also addressed another Sunday law bill, and this one is in connection with the Chicago World Fair. Now, what we learned is that the Chicago World Fair, um, I believe is the first one, and the next one's gonna be five years later, and that's gonna be in Nashville. So that's the one where, um, uh, the Parthenon, is it the Parthenon? I think that's what Pantheon? it is. The Parthenon. Mm -hmm. There's a Pantheon, but that's a different thing. So the Parthenon, which they have a replica. Of, <coughs> yeah. and, and they both run from beginning on May 1st. Um, and is it 1893? And the next one's going to be 1897, right? So four years later. So, so every four years, they would have one of these world fairs, first one being in Chicago. And the, the Chicago one is, it's actually not called the Chicago World's Fair. That's just a common name for it. Um, it was the Columbian National uh, Exposition or Exhibition. And same with the, the Nashville one. It's an exhibition of some sort. So these are, um, I don't know who's, how they started these things. I haven't looked into the history of that. But anyway, we have this connection here in 1893 to a World's Fair. And this is going to be 126 years prior to 2019. So we had made this note, this chronological connection of the 126 years and asked if that's a valid connection. And, and we're probably going to explore that a little bit more, not today, but in some of our other studies. So the other point that is quite interesting here is that Jones is presenting a message that the loud cry has begun, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, that they're in the time of the Sunday law. Um, so he's taking what Ellen White has said about the Sunday law, and he's seeing that this is what has happened with this world's fair. And we think in some ways, he overstates his case. That is, he 
he's not he's not correct but he is correct but he's in a typical line and so what happens in 1893 must be connected to our history also in 1893 uh, there is um, uh, these two brothers Caldwell and uh, can't remember the other guy's name it starts with an S uh, anybody remember their names? Um, I can find it here really quickly. Uh, Caldwell and um, Stanton. Is it Stanton? Anybody remember? Brother Stanton. So they are claiming, yeah, Stanton and Caldwell. So Ellen White says, both these men, Brenner and Stanton and Caldwell, were at the General Conference. Could they not discern there the revelations of the Spirit of God? So this is Ellen White writing. Could they not see that God was opening the window of heaven and pouring out a blessing? Testimonies had been given, correcting and counseling the church, and many had made a practical application of the message to the Laodicean church, confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. They were hearing the voice of Jesus speaking to them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him, come into him, and will sup with him and he with me. So, Brethren Stanton and Caldwell are not touched by this message. So, is Jones correct in claiming that the loud cry message had begun in 1893? Would we say that he's correct? And if he's correct, how is he correct? Uh, wasn't he seeing these Sunday laws as as a Sunday law? And so he was he was going beyond uh, where that Sunday law was at. Okay, and yeah, so. We know the Sunday law didn't happen, but definitely there were inroads towards a Sunday law. The basic principles were there, but it just never manifested itself ultimately as a Sunday law, even in the World's Fair itself. No, they made some compromises, and Jones tries to say, well, their basis for um, being open on Sunday were the same arguments they had were for being closed on Sunday. So the principles were the same, but it didn't manifest itself in a Sunday law. It's a type of a Sunday law. And we have the same thing in our history, a type of the Sunday law, the pandemic, <clears throat> which is going to be 126 years later. Right. So we have the pandemic marked in November of 2019 that the pandemic begins. So there is some kind of connection between what happens in 1893 and in 2019. So I think understanding this history is, is important. But the other aspect that we have here is that when we start to look at this comparison between uh, 1893 and 2019, these two typical Sunday laws, uh, we also see a false loud cry message. And somebody had pointed out the same thing occurred um, in Millerite history during the midnight cry. You have the Waterton uh, tent, Watertown or whatever it is, uh, group, right? So you always have this counterfeit in the true. And we're trying to understand our line. We're trying to understand where we are. And we know also that the message of righteousness by faith is tied up with the Sunday law. That is, I think we have seen more clearly, at least I have, why the third angel's message of righteousness by faith is righteousness by faith in verity, because all the messages are messages of righteousness by faith. But it's, it's now part of the experience occurs with the Sunday law test, the test over Sunday or the Sabbath. 
So we're going to go on and read um, number four of Joan's talks and, and keep all of these things in mind. Um, so the question had been handed up. Can the states logically refuse to fall into line with the Supreme Court decision defining the national constitution in its related relation to religion? So somebody asks him this question. Uh, can the states refuse what, what's happened? But Jones says, no, sir, as a matter of fact, the states do not need to do it. The Supreme Court of the United States has fallen into line with the states. That is the way the thing has already been done. That is the mischief, mischief of it. So Jones is still seeing that the thing is done, right? The Sunday law is here. And, and he's not wrong. He's wrong in the sense in which he thinks it. But he's not wrong when it comes to understanding the line. And in this line of Jones, we had 1888, which is a rejection of the third angel's message. So the first, second, and third angel's messages had been rejected. But there is, seems to be in 1893 an acceptance of the third angel's message. That is, there's an acceptance of righteousness by faith. And people seem to be awake. This issue with the Sunday is now really prominent among Seventh-day Adventists but it's not gonna result in the actual Sunday law. And that's because why? The first generation has failed, right? They've rejected the foundation of their message. It can't do its work. So Jones is gonna go on. So he answered that question and he says, I begin the lesson tonight by reading Revelation 14, nine. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, voice if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand i need not present any other evidence tonight to show that we are in the same are in the time when that verse is fulfilled and merely to refer to the points we mentioned last night three distinct points that were noticed last night shut us up to that one thing now that is the warning which we are to give to the world and no man can give the third angel's message without giving it just exactly as it reads. But what is the consequence of disregarding the message in that verse? The unmingled wine of the wrath of God. Then what is the next thing that comes in that respect? I mean, in the fulfillment of this prophecy, what is the next thing we are to look for? The audience, the wrath of God. Yes. Now we have come to the loud cry, haven't we? That part of the prophecy is reached. We have come to the image of the beast. That part is reached. We have come to the image of the be, uh, or pardon me, um, that prophecy is fulfilled. Now, of course, in the workings of the image of the beast, there are many things to come in fulfillment of that. But all these things, persecutions, deceiving miracles, etc., are simply the consequence of what has been done, simply the speaking and acting of the image that is already made. We are not to look now for any great wondrous marked movement in legislation or government to fulfill that part of the prophecy because the image is made that is fulfilled. What comes in the future in legislation and in the strifes and contentions and the rioting and warring, warring with the evil that will come is simply the inevitable outcome and consequence of this. Then what next will there be in the line of this prophecy which is here before us? The audience, the wrath of God. Yes. I might put the question in another way now to make it a little plainer. Is there any piece of legislation, any special move of this government for which we are now to look as the fulfillment of this prophecy in connection with the making of the image of the beast? What have we been looking for all the time? We have been looking for legislation, some move to be made or something to be done um, in or by the government that would make the image of the beast. That was what our eyes were upon all the time. But now we do, but now do we look for that anymore? The audience says, no, sir. Truth. Now then, that having been done, isn't all that pertains to the image of the beast in that, and all that comes henceforth respecting the image of the beast and its work, is it anything more than the consequence of what is now here? Is not all that the image is to do in the image when it is made to begin with? Then all that comes henceforth 
pertaining to the image of the beast, being in that which is done, what great point in the words of the message stands next? The audience, the seven last plagues. Yes, the next thing that follows the working of the image of the beast in that prophecy is the seven last plagues. So if we are to take what Jones is saying here, he's saying that the image of the beast has been formed and the wrath of God, of course, is the seven last plagues. And so they are expecting to see the wrath of God and the seven last plagues to follow and that they are to give a message that the image of the beast is here and that the mark of the beast is here. Does that seem kind of remarkable to anyone, any one of you, that Jones is taking this position at that time? Because we wouldn't really generally have this idea that that view was held by Seventh-day Adventists at any time in history, that the Sunday law was here, that the wrath of God was going to be immediately following what had happened. Is this kind of new to people? I've heard it before. I think it's What's new. that? I don't think it's new. No. You have to have image kept to be established before the Sunday law. Yeah. So, so here, it, it seems to me that you know this part of Adventist history, this part of A.G. A.T. Jones history, um, in what he's giving at the 1893 General Conference, even though I had read this years before, I don't think I picked up on what he was actually saying. And that's because I didn't really understand the things that I understand now about the lines and the time that we're in and what the loud cry is. So I think people who aren't in this message, who read what Jones are, is saying here, doesn't really see anything surprising. They would just say, oh, well, you know, there's some stuff happening. And Jones says, well, this is the loud cry. And you know, that's fine. But I think we have to look at this a little bit differently. We have to take this a little bit more seriously. This isn't Jones just jumping the gun. This is actually prophecy being fulfilled. Yeah, so Jones had no evidence the Romish church had taken over the entire globe, however. And that's true. But... Were Adventists really expecting the Catholic Church to, to just take over the entire globe before the, in the National Sunday Law in the United States? I believe some would have. Some would have. But when you look back at Adventism at that time, how many Adventists, how many people actually thought the Roman Church would ever have power in the United States? I don't think very many, actually. Yeah, but I think many Adventists, when Ellen White talks about the rise of the Catholic Church, I mean, they could see that internationally. But within the United States itself, it seemed an extremely unlikely scenario. Americans it wasn't until the 60s, I think, that uh, there was any big to do with uh, Catholics having any sway in uh, this country, and most of all in politics. Right. So, so we have in the 1850s, we have people like Avro Manhattan talking about the role that both the United States, well, not the United States, Russia, and the Catholic Church have. And he says that people would look at Russia and the United States, but neglect to look at the role of the Vatican. And so he wrote that book, The Vatican in World Politics. And he wrote many other books, books about the Vatican and its role in politics. So the Vatican, even by the 1950s, it was hard for people to, to grasp what was happening. So, so you wouldn't have this in 1893. Nobody would be looking for the Vatican all of a sudden to have this power. It really was a powerless entity as far as people knew. Now, they knew the principles of the papacy had to be followed by the United States. It would speak as a dragon. But, but they didn't really think that the papacy itself would have that power. So they weren't really looking for that. 
They were looking for the papal principles to be exercised, but not by the papacy itself, per se. But the papacy had instilled those principles in the institutions, the educational institutions, and so forth. And so those principles were being worked out. And that's the way that Jones would have seen it. I don't think I ever seen Jones really talking about the rise of the papacy itself, in a sense, as a political movement. Right, but he will talk about the papacy and the principles behind the papacy. So there definitely is a, a difference that we have had as Adventists as we've looked at world events. How we see the role of the papacy, how we see the role of the Protestants, uh, the role of the Soviet Union. Um, so looking at, at that power, which is an atheistic power. How are these powers all to be involved in a Sunday law? And from my perspective, as somebody who's been an Adventist for you know, 40 years, um, I guess technically you know, 41 years, um, you know, I've seen lots of different takes on the Sunday law, on how it was going to come about, about what powers were involved, what political entities at the time that existed, how they were going to maneuver and bring about a Sunday law. And the big problem that I've always seen is that the world is becoming more and more secular. In Jones' day, the world had at least a biblical um, understanding. They, they understood the biblical worldview. They understood what the stories in the Bible. Um, they were biblically literate. Today, the world is not biblically literate. They know very little about the Bible. Even Christians know very little about the Bible. So, so we see here something happening that, um, that must be typical. That what is happening in 1893, that Jones is not wrong. He's wrong in a certain sense just as this movement was wrong. But Jones is also being endorsed by the spirit of prophecy. That is, she says that these messages, uh, that the spirit of God was working upon people, and it was bringing confession and repentance. So the work of the Holy Spirit that needed to be done and needed to be accomplished was being accomplished in 1893. And we can say that about our movement was the work of the Holy Spirit uh, happening within our movement. We would have to say yes, because God was leading our movement. But still, the things that we predicted did not come about. So Jones goes on, he says, now put the three things together. We were looking for the image of the beast, then the seven last plagues, and then the coming of the Lord. The image of the beast has come, hasn't it? The coming of the Lord is in the future, isn't it? But the seven last plagues are between them. And what is the next great marked thing in the history of the world and of mankind and salvation? The seven last plagues. That being so, it becomes us to think very seriously where we are living, doesn't it? It becomes us to think seriously how we are living. So when we look at this scenario, what's missing in Jones' line of what's supposed to happen? Because he believes the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, right? So that the image of the beast has been formed. We're in the Sunday law in 1893. Are the where, seven, it, where did you have to have the midnight cry before the Sunday law, right? Well, the loud cry, right? Loud so cry. You have to have the loud cry before the Sunday law. Right. Now, they already have the Great Controversy by Ellen White. They have the 1884 Great Controversy and the 1888 Great Controversy. You know, this is five years after the second one was published. Um, and Ellen White lays out lots of things that has to happen in connection with the Sunday Law that he's passing. So first, we would have the image of the beast test. And then we would have the Sunday Law proper in the United States. And in that time, we would have 
the red mighty angel of Revelation 18 come down at the Sunday law and and it would join with the third angel and it would swell into a loud cry. So wouldn't he be saying what we are now to do? And he does mention it. He says we're in the loud cry. But he expects the wrath of God next. Now, maybe that's what we're warning people about is the wrath of God. But this is 1893. How many Adventists are there in the world in 1893? Anybody know? I don't know. I'm thinking a few thousand. Okay. Well, there's more than a few thousand, but but yeah, there's there's not a great deal of Adventists in the world. The Adventists really hadn't started their their missionary work yet. So, um, I mean, they had a bit, but you know, it's pretty minor. They they don't have a huge global impact. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I know at, you know, the 1888 General Conference, there's not very many people there. I mean, they can get them all into a picture, including you know, basically all the kids and everything. So, so we don't have a huge worldwide church. So why is he believing that they're in the loud cry and that this world, this, the world is going to be warned. It, it just seems kind of parallel to the situation today in this movement. If we're going to take the idea that we now are in the Sunday law, right? And that this is the Sunday law that's being talked about in scripture, the national Sunday law. Uh, this movement has is in no place to warn the world, let alone Adventists, right? Well, we, we, we take this as a typical, this whole line, our whole line is the Sunday law. Yeah. So um, the typical, the, the idea of it being typical it, it is that's maybe why he was seeing it um, as, you know, that Sunday law has now taken place and now he's, he's seeing what's on beyond it um, and yeah. trying to work it out logically in that way. And I, it, like you had mentioned, it doesn't appear that he's, he's like seeing the fact that it's typical or, um, uh, or it's it's not happening in his it's like he's zoomed in in on it instead of um, being pulled out and seeing how that whole line is for the for the Millerites. I don't think they had a a grasp on that at this point. Right, I, 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 they definitely did not. Right, so. Um... Because they're expecting the Sunday law, even though the church is small, it doesn't have a worldwide mission, you know, in place. And so, you know, from us at this perspective, we can kind of see that. Sometimes our world seems a little smaller than it really is. I mean, um, when I was a kid and I climbed up a hill, I thought I could see the whole world. <laughs> so, you know, we, we think that, um, you know, sort of what we see is all that is, but there's billions of people who are unwarned. Now, I know a lot of Christians who believe that, you know, Jesus isn't going to come back until everybody hears the gospel. That's, that's what they think has to happen. And once everybody hears the gospel, then Jesus comes back. And it's not really an Adventist idea so much, though you start to see it creeping into Adventism. You know, that's why Jesus hasn't come back. Everybody hasn't heard of him. Um, but we know that what has to happen is Christ's character has to be reproduced in his people, in 144,000 living saints. And even if he's going to look at what the 144,000 constitute, uh, there wouldn't be 144,000 Adventists. There wouldn't be 144,000 people who are going to go through the seven last plagues. Right? Right? 
So why would he think that Jesus is coming back very soon? Why would he think he's in the Sunday law and that the plagues are coming? So why would he do that? Somebody needs to answer. I'm going to say, I don't know, Theodore. You don't know. Yeah. Well, what is there? I mean, is there a rationale that he could possibly have based on what he knows? Well, wouldn't it be because he experienced it by, I would think it would be because he, he's experiencing the the legislative, legislative part of it being fulfilled. Okay, so he's looking at one little aspect. It doesn't seem justified to take that position. Now, in, um, at the end of 1890, there were about 30,000 Adventists. And if we're going to have the position that the 144,000 are Adventists, I mean, we're not even going to have 144,000 Adventists till sometimes in the 1910s. So... And Adventists have believed there will be 144,000 living saints. So how could they reconcile that? Why, why is there this disconnect from what we believe and what we expect? Do we see the same problem today in this movement? Do we see the same thing in Millerite history in 1844? Disconnect. So there's a disconnect from what, what we believe. So we have certain beliefs. Adventists had certain beliefs in Millerite history about what had to happen before Jesus comes back. They'd been teaching these things for years. But when it comes to the midnight cry, they just set those things aside, right? Seven last plagues aren't coming, yet they've been teaching about the seven last plagues. So, and we did this in this movement, didn't we? We skipped steps. We just expected that... Um, we would all of a sudden, you know, have Nashville hit by a fireball by, or by an atomic attack by Islam and that everything was just going to happen. And yet we hadn't done the work that we were supposed to do. We had warned Nashville and, and we did get international attention. So in some ways. Hi, guys. Accomplished things. Hi, Mark. Hi, guys. And I say, I say to you, Fedor. Sorry, being rude to you 
just start talking. I just say hi, and I did make it home for this daddy and Tuesdays from tomorrow. I say to myself, I know it will be late. Okay, sounds good, for Mark. Three those days, but I heard you saying of learning. I heard you saying to other people of learning about Christ coming second time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the world needs to be warned. Yes, uh, not me. Yeah, but the world needs to be warned. Uh, no, uh, not about warned. Warned is just me. Okay. Okay, Mark. Thanks. Uh, I... This it is it is swings, and I just said I'm not learning about Christ coming second time. I have a greatness pain. Okay. Hey, thanks, Mark. And I I show you the book. I, I did bought uh, today. Okay. So what we see here in in Joan's position. Okay. So what we see here in Joan's position is um, is inconsistent with his belief system. That is, if there's only thirty thousand Adventists, it doesn't make sense that these events are going to happen in in the brief period of time in which he's looking at to believe that the plagues are going to begin and the loud cry has not even been given so so we see this in every history though that there are things that have to occur but somehow we sidestep them now when it comes to the understanding of righteousness by faith and the sunday law one thing that we are seeing is that there's a work that needs to be done in our own lives that we are also neglecting. We're neglecting to take that into account because we don't really understand how far we are from God. We don't really understand our spiritual condition, how unchristlike we are. And so we saw in this movement, when we expected events to happen in July 18th, what we imagined about ourselves and where we would be and where we stood in the big scheme of things was completely unrealistic. What's that? I was going to say what you said, it's, uh, not real. <laughs> yeah. Now, and you can see here, even in, in this discussion that goes on, that the focus is really on external things that have to occur. Um, though Jones does, you know, address the internal. But I don't think even Jones really grasps uh, how far we are from God. But anyway, let's look, go on here. So somebody asks, is it, is it necessary to amend the Constitution? And, and Elder Jones says, the Constitution, nothing. No, we have no Constitution anymore. It is set aside. It is taken clear out of the way. We can't use it anymore. What could an amendment do more than it ha than has been done? Don't you see they have put aside the Constitution? What could anybody want with an amendment? Now, this question has been brought up by other people in our time. Because we know that when... This, this beast that has two horns like a lamb but speaks as a dragon, it speaks through its legislative assembly, right? Does the Constitution have to be changed in order for a Sunday law to occur? Do we need an amendment? I'll say yes. Okay, so some people say yes, but Jones is saying, well, no, 
you know, they can just set aside the Constitution. And, and we saw that in the pandemic. Did they need to change the Constitution? Um, well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. They just set it aside. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, in Alberta, we just have had an, a new premier uh, put into power. It's not through an election, but just the other premier retired. And the way it works here in Alberta politics is that the next leader of the party becomes the premier. So the new leader is somebody named Danielle Smith, and she's a libertarian. And she fired uh, the health minister and um, who was at the head of the pan pandemic, you know, initiative, and also all of the people who ran Alberta Health, the, the whole uh, administration, and um, has stated quite clearly that uh, people who lost their jobs over not getting vaccinated, that that was unjust and that should never have happened. Um, now, you can see, of course, that their constant, and she says their constitutional rights were ignored. <clears throat> so you can see that um, you don't need to change the law to have unjust things being done. You just have to have people not follow the law. Now, Carl says Lincoln suspended certain liberties as well. And of course, you can always bring in, uh, you can suspend the Constitution because you can have like the War Measures Act we have in Canada, which now they changed. Uh, they took people's constitutional rights away uh, with the truckers uh, using that uh, act. Um, so yeah, you can have, you don't necessarily have to have legislation. You just need to have people exercising unjust power. But Jones goes on, but the thought which I want to just now to get before you is that the next great and marked event in the history of this world and the work of salvation is what is spoken of here in the text. This shows it on the faith of it, face of it. Look at it again. We are to give this warning to the world, right? So we have to give the loud cry. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, that is the warning we are to give. Well, in view of what it is that the warning is, is given, um, so it's going to be given because the wine of the wrath of God. What is the wine of the wrath of God? The seven last plagues. Then doesn't it follow on the face of it that the seven last plagues are the next thing after that warning? So he would put the loud cry in between this. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, that the seven last pl last plagues are the next thing after the warning and that the warning will wind up with the seven last plagues. So he's saying that if we give the warning, the seven last plagues will follow. And we are now where that warning begins with a loud voice in its very words. Then doesn't that which is now begun and the work which is now in our hands end with the bringing us face to face with the seven last plagues the audience says yes sir when that work of warning is done where will we be at the pouring out of the plagues now are you satisfied that this is so are you satisfied that the seven last plagues is the next things that comes after this warning to the world the audience says yes sir then as we go about to give that warning isn't it in the nature of the case that we are to do it in the view of the plagues that are to fall upon those whom we speak of it and that we must be faithful to that message ourselves, which we are giving if we want to be shielded when the plagues do fall, of which the message speaks. But who will be shielded in that time? Those who have the covering of the Almighty drawn over them. And that covering of the Almighty is the covering that the prophet Isaiah spoke about, saying, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom deck, decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. That is the covering that God draws over his people, which shields every one from the wrath of God now and forever. Have you that robe of righteousness? So here he's going to really be bringing uh, all this that he's done as this sort of preamble about this, we're in the Sunday law, the wrath of God is coming. We have to warn people about the wrath of God. But the question is, are we 
in a condition to do that. And so Ellen White says that at this general conference, that the work of repentance and confession did occur. But yet the Sunday law did not result. Adventists made attempts to give the message of warning to the world. But we know that the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins with the third angel, and it swells to a loud cry. Now, could, could we argue or could we have the, the perspective that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in 1893 and that ever since then it has been swelling to a loud cry? Could we have that perspective? And if not, why not? And if we could, why, why would we take that perspective? I hope you get my question. Well, the church hasn't progressed much in light, you know, since, what, 1863 or so? Or? Okay, so the church isn't progressing. Now, we do, of course, have the 1888 message, which is a type of progression. And yeah. we have this event in 1893, uh, the World's Fair. But the church is not going in the direction that it needs to go. Right. Even though there's repentance and confession at this general conference, the church did not fulfill its commission. But but somebody could argue, well, it just began there and that the church has been slowly progressing. This swelling to a loud cry just happens over a period of, you know, 130 years or whatever. Right. But but we know that we are in a repeat of history that the first, second, and third angel's messages were rejected. So the church postured that it accepted the third angel's message while it had really rejected all three messages. So when we come to the end of this period, this second generation from 1888 to 1919, you now have the beginning of the books of a new order and a new organization, right? So all that had been attempted under the second generation has fallen apart. The new view of the daily becomes prominent. We have um, uh, pantheism in its various forms within Adventism. We, by 1919, we, we have this whole idea that we want to be like the world, that how we're going to get this gospel, the third angel's message, or the three angels' message is spread to the world is by becoming like the world, by being qualified in their institutions so that they will listen to us. So Jones is, is part of a movement that was meant to lead to a certain work. So Jones is not responsible for that not occurring. Correct? At least at this point. We, right. know, he, we know he becomes distant so, yeah. because he fails himself, as do others. But it, it's going to happen near the end of this, this period of time. So here God has had given the first generation an opportunity. It's failed. And after 1888, the second generation has its opportunity, but it's going to fail. And the third generation, it's going to fail as well. It's a progressive destruction of four. So when we get to 1890 or 1957, we have the fourth generation begin, and it's completely in darkness. So... Jones' history here, we have to take as a type of what has happened, and specifically we can take it as applying to our movement. But we can see that Jones has the correct message, that we need Christ's righteousness. But can we have Christ's righteousness if we reject the first two messages? Because don't they contain Christ's righteousness? Yeah. 
right? So it can't just be the third angel's message because you can't have a third without a first and second. And it's going to be in this history that Ellen White really starts to make that clear. So Joan says, now another thing right there, we are living in view of another fearful fact, that is, if that message which we are now to give is not received, it has attached, it has attached to it the fearful consequences that the wine of the wrath of God will be received. So that when the message finishes, the wrath of God succeeds it. I say we are living in the presence of that fact and the work which is to bring us all face to face with that fact as it is there recorded is now begun. Therefore, will not that give a power to the health reform that it has had not has not yet had? When the health reform is given to the people of God, it is defined as that which will fit the people for translation. That is the meaning of health reform. The leading thing, the great thing that God intends health reform to do is to prepare his people for translation. But we have to go through the seven last plagues before we are translated. And if a man's blood is impure and full of gross material, will he be able to pass through that time when the air is sick with pestilence? Indeed, he cannot. Now, what is Joan saying here about uh, the role of health reform? Would, would we agree with him in what he's saying exactly? Yes. No. Okay, you would say yes. So the role of health reform is that we can get through the seven last plagues, that we will be healthy enough to get through the seven last plagues. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, it, it doesn't sound right to me. No. Uh, okay. So, so we know that the role of health reform is one is so that we can have a healthy mind and body so that we can understand God's word, so we have clear thinking, and that we can also uh, be fit to do the work that is given us to do in giving the message. I mean, if we're, we're sick and we, we're unhealthy, we're not going to think clearly. We're not going to develop a Christ-like character, right, if we're, if we're disobeying God's health laws. Um, but we're not going to... Um, we're, we're going to be using resources just to care for our health because we're transgressing God's laws. And, and that's going to hinder that work. But also, the health message is meant to be the right hand of the gospel, to reach people who are suffering from health problems with the simple treatments that God has given us, hydrotherapy and, and the laws of health. So I don't think it's just that a man won't be able to pass through that time because he's sick, right? I don't think that's the idea. The air is sick with pestilence. I don't think that's the idea. That if we a lot of other a lot of other people that, that eat good, they're not Adventists or Christians. <laughs> right. I mean, the reason why we pass through that time is God does not let the plagues come upon us because we have a character. That has been sealed. The plagues only fall on the wicked, not on the righteous. So I, I find this kind of an odd idea, but um, I mean, I can kind of get get it a little bit. The importance of health reform. So we know that that was an issue in that day. That many people were not interested in the progression of health reform that had been brought out in in 1863. Um, it, it was actually slowly accepted within Adventism. So he says, that brings us face to face with some more solemn experiences, doesn't it? And some more solemn truth. A great many solemn questions have already been presented to us. And brethren, there are a great many more that are still to come to us. We are in the most solemn time we ever saw. Let us consider it. Now let us take the points that have already been presented in the different lessons that have been given. The searching thoughts and solemn experiences in our religious profession to which we have been brought face to face. I want to know now how on earth it is ever possible for any one of us to meet these experiences without Jesus Christ in the full. I would like to have somebody tell. Audience says we can't do it. Of course we can't. 
then brethren, let us have him come in in his fullness as quickly as possible. We need him every moment, and each succeeding lesson brings to view more and more our need of him. Now, as there are two point, other points I want to present tonight, for the present purpose, I will just sketch through what the further lesson of the plagues is. When the first plague falls, it falls on the men that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image, the very people to whom the warning of this message is given. Then the plagues follow each other in direct succession into the sixth, under which the evil spirits gather the kings of the earth and of the whole world to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This battle is fought when the Savior comes, for I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war upon him that sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. And at that time, the seventh angel pours out his vial in the air, and there comes a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there are voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there's a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Every island flees away and the mountains are not found. The heavens depart as a scroll and every mountain and island are moved out of their places. <coughs> and the beast in his image, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And the remnant of the wicked world who went not up to the battle of Armageddon were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. The sword of him that sits upon the horse is the brightness of the Lord's coming. So he just gives the summary of, of, of what is going to happen during the plagues. He says, then the events that are directly and inseparably connected with the end of the world are the events that follow the work to the doing of which we are now completely shut up. That is the living fact now. So he's saying in order for all these things to happen, there has to be, be this warning given so that these plagues can fall because if the people aren't warned, uh, the plagues can't fall. That's basically his argument. Now he's not going into detail about what the battle of Armageddon is or anything like that. Uh, Brethren, do you believe that the seven last plagues are coming just as certainly as the image of the beast has come? The audience says, yes, sir. How now? Audience, yes. Now we are looked, now we looked for the image of the beast to come. It has come. Now what are we to look for? The seven last plagues. Do you believe that the end of the world is coming with the seven last plagues, just as certainly as the image of the beast is made? The audience says, yes. Do you believe that the end of the world comes um, when the seventh last plague, seven, seventh last plagues come? The audience says, yes, then brethren, these things mean something to us just now. We will leave that point there now and take up another thought with reference to our government and what consequences must be and can only be of what government has now done. That is the consequences of the government itself. So, so in this first part, he's just summed up this idea that we need Christ's righteousness. We have to give this warning. The seven last plagues are the next thing that we are looking for prophetically to occur. The image of the beast has been made up. So now it's the wrath of God. And we have to warn people of that. And we need to have the character of Christ in order to do that. And we need to follow health reform. Now let us begin with Acts 17, 26 and 27. Paul is calling the attention of the people to God. And he says, And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the time before appointed in the bounds of their habitation. Then God made this nation of men to dwell on the earth, and he determined the bounds of the habitations of the people of this nation, and how much space this nation should occupy. And he has given a portion of time to this nation. And what did he do it for? The next verse reads, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, though he be not far from every one of us. And if they might feel after him and happily find him. No, there's no hap about that. If they feel after him, what then? They would find him. If anybody feels after him, he will find him. In the fourth chapter of Daniel, we learn that God rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. 
God's idea concerning the nations is that they shall seek him. Well then, when a nation rejects the Lord, what use has he for it? None. But he will reject a nation as long as the nation, but will he reject a nation as long as the nation will seek him? No, sir. He will cut off a nation so long as there are, will he cut off a nation so long as there are any people there to seek the Lord? He will not. He didn't before the flood, neither did he in Sodom and Gomorrah. If he could have found 10 people that would seek the Lord in Sodom and Gomorrah, he would not have destroyed those cities, but he couldn't find them. When he made the promise to Abraham, he said to him, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Had God established bounds to their habitation? Yes. And what did he do it for? That they should seek the Lord. As long as there was any possibility of their seeking the Lord, they held the place where God put them. And the Lord would not give the land to Abraham, his friend, nor to Abraham's seed, as long as there were people who would seek the Lord. The Lord's people could not occupy because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. But when the iniquity of the Amorites was full, there was no use for them anymore. When the Lord establishes a people on earth to seek the Lord and they will not seek him, what then is the use of their staying any longer on the earth? To let them stay on the earth after that was only to perpetuate iniquity for no possible use. So the Lord brought his people in there at that time and drove out the Amorites. He told his people not to do as the Amorites did, lest the land spew them out as it had spewed out the Amorites. But his people did the very thing he told them not to do. And the land did empty them out, and he gave them into the hands of the king of Babylon. He had established the kingdom of Babylon for a purpose. He set the bounds of their habitation. And what was that for? It was that they should seek the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar sought the Lord in his day, and he proclaimed the glory of the Lord, the honor of the Lord, and the existence of the Lord to all the nations of the earth. You remember that proclamation he made in Daniel 4th chapter. I thought it good to tell what the Most High hath done for me. And he told his experience. Let us read how far this proclamation reached. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show signs and wonders that the Most High God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. The Lord had said unto Nebuchadnezzar that he had given him all these lands round about and all the nations that they should serve him and his sons and his son's son until the very time of his, his land came. And then what? Many nations shall serve themselves of him. God had determined the time before appointed as well as the bound of his habitation so that when the time of his land came, many nations would serve themselves of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's son succeeded him, then his grandson. Instead of Belshazzar seeking the Lord and honoring the Lord, he took the vessels of the house of the Lord and used them in his lascivious feasts, thus turning his back upon, the God, upon God completely. Then what use did the Lord have for him or his nation anymore? He had no use, no more use. That same hour there came the fingers of a man's hand and wrote upon the wall in the presence of the king, and the meaning of the words that were written is this, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, when we look at what Jones is presenting here, he's here in 1893, and he's presenting the three angels' messages. He's saying that the image of the beast has been made, that we are now in the time of the loud cry, and that the next thing is the seven last plagues. And now he moves to Daniel 4 and Daniel 5. Is there prophetic significance that um, A.T. Jones does this, that he is unaware of?
Because why has Jalen done this? Why has he brought up these verses? I mean, he has his reason. <clears throat> but I mean, prophetically, why has he? Because what is he pointing to? What do Daniel 4 and 5 represent? What happens in Daniel 4? What 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 is it about? You guys need to be more responsive here. And we just read about Mini Mini Tikal Ufarsen. What is that? Uh, 126. Okay, so we have the 126 being mentioned, right? Yep. Okay, and we've said that there's 126 years from 1893 to 2019, right? Yeah. But also also, is he not pointing to the 2520? Yeah. Yes. Right. Both the 2520 for northern Israel and the 2520 for southern Israel, for Judah, right? Daniel chapter 4, typifying Judah's 2520. Chapter 5, typifying northern Israel's 2520. So he's brought up the prophetic mirror. And is not, um, is not this all a part of the structure of the prophetic mirror? The 126 years that goes from 1863, the 126 years from 1888. And now can we argue there's 126 years from 1893? That there isn't just two 126-year periods. And what would that mean? You mean three twenty six hundred one twenty six yeah, periods? Yeah, three hundred twenty six year periods that we've now marked: the one from eighteen sixty three, the one right. from eighteen eighty eight, and now the one from eighteen ninety three that Jones is a part of. And that's going to tie us to nineteen eighty nine, to two thousand fourteen, and to two thousand nineteen. And it's, it's going to bring this understanding of the 2520 into this idea, because this is the 2520, that's going to be part of the foundation that was rejected, right? Which is why the third angel's message was rejected. So I think it's very interesting that this is where Jones goes in his, um, in his study. Thus the Lord brought up the Medes and Persians. Did they seek the Lord too? God had called Cyrus by name before he came up there. Cyrus did not know the Lord. The Lord said, I have surnamed thee. Thou hast not known me. But Cyrus found the Lord and proclaimed the name of all the, of, to all the nations. God's prophet in Babylon took the word of God to Cyrus. And then we see what Cyrus did. First chapter in Ezra, first verse to the third. Right. So he's going to deal with this. And we know that what he's talking about here, because we're all very familiar with this, because this is part of our understanding of this movement, the Babylonian captivity, uh, the time of the end that occurs with Cyrus. So he's brought up not just the 2520, but he's, you know, in the sense of the, the two different 2520s, but he's also brought up the application of the 2520. To, to Judah, right? The end of the 70 years. Right, so he's, he's just going to quote these, quote these verses about Cyrus. And do we take this history and apply it to our history?
Do we look at Daniel 10, 11, and 12? Do we look at the first four verses of Daniel chapter 11 and see that there's a connection to our history? So Cyrus found the Lord and proclaimed him to all the nations of the earth. It had been done even before Cyrus came in. Darius succeeded Belshazzar. We read in Daniel 6, 26 and 27 what Darius did. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men shall tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Now he's bringing this up because he wants to show how nations close their probations. But they're also given an opportunity to give a message. <clears throat> but in doing so, he's bringing up really the very foundation of our message, right? For he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that sh which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be e even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. What is a that is a splendid proclamation of God and his glory and his power. It sounds like the words of the prophet Daniel himself. Well, the Medes and Persians sought the Lord and found him. But turn now to the 11th chapter of Daniel, where we read, Also I, that is the angel Gabriel, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now, now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. And a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds, winds of heaven. Well, here's the very verses that this we are now studying in this movement and trying to understand their application. So it's very providential that this is where Jones leads to. Now, of course, he's bringing this up. He's, he's gonna show that Greece is going to be next. So he doesn't understand all of the implications of these verses and that these directly refer to the United States. That we can take this application of these kings, that Persia is going to represent the United States and Grisha is going to represent the globalists, the UN. Right? So he doesn't see that. But we can see that what he's doing and what he's presenting, that there's prophetic significance that he's prevent presenting these very verses. Yes, Jeff. You have a comment? No, nothing. Okay. Nothing. Okay. So that is Grisha. We read now in Daniel 10, 20. Then he, Gabriel, knoweth from whence before I come unto thee. And now will I return and fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. Right? So we know all about this. Uh, the angel would stay there as long as he could bear it. And when they had gone so far along that they would not seek the Lord, the angels would go. And when the angels went, Persia went too, and Grisha came. But what did the Lord establish Grisha for? That they might seek the Lord. Now read in the eighth chapter. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of their nation, and not in his power, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So you see every time it is because transgression has come to the full that a nation falls and transgressors are come to the full when they set themselves against the Lord. It is because the measure of their iniquity is filled at last that another nation comes. So you can see the philosophy of the whole matter is contained in that verse that God establishes nations that they shall seek the Lord. And when they refuse to do it, and turn their backs upon him. Then the next thing is that that nation leaves the world. There's nothing else for it. The nation that followed Greece was Rome. And Christ came in Rome's day. And the gospel of Christ was preached to Rome. Although it was fearfully corrupt. 
and then that gospel of Christ was professed as an outward form by an apostate church. And she sees the power of the Roman government to compel people to recognize the Roman religion, to compel men to dis disobey the Lord. Then what became of the Roman government? It was swept from the earth. As bad as the government was in the days of Tiberius, as bad as it was in the days of Claudius, and in the days of Nero, yet God preached the gospel to Rome and brought multitudes of soul to the light and knowledge of his gospel. Even to Nero himself, the gospel was twice preached by the apostle Paul, and there was open to him the joys of heaven. But when the gospel was perverted as it was and made only a cloak to sanction ungodliness, and instead of seeking the Lord, indeed, perverted the means, the very means that God offered for salvation. What could the Lord do for a people like that? The gospel is only the means that God has to save a person. But when the gospel is taken and used simply as a cloak for wickedness, how can the Lord possibly save the person who thus uses it? Then there is nothing that can touch him at all. When that was done in Rome, the Roman Empire, by the power of an apostate church, how then how could it stand any longer? It had to be swept away from the earth. And now this nation has been captured by the very same kind of iniquity. Here is an apostasy. The churches have turned away from God and have seized upon the power of this government. It has sold itself to them and now compels people to dishonor God. Then what is the next thing for this nation? Audience, destruction. Yes, but before the Lord overthrows it, he will send a message to whoever will be saved. And what is that message? The audience, the third angel's message. Yes. Then does not that shut us up again tonight, face to face, to the, that one thing that the third angel's message, as it reads, is the only thing to be given under the sun. And it is to be given to save such people as will be saved from the ruin that hangs over this devoted nation that has been inveigled and carried captive by an apostate, professed Protestant church. Well, then the end of the world is the next thing. Then we are not, then are we not right now in the things that we are to preach, held, wrapped up and concerned daily and hourly with the events that bring the end of the world. It is any, is it any difficulty, brethren, to get people of the world even to see that? Is it any difficulty to get people of the world to see what has become of the nations that have gone before? Is there any difficulty in getting worldlings themselves to see that there is a union of church and state here, that the church has carried captive the government of the United States? Any difficulty to get them to see that? I tell you, brethren, when we go with the power of God and state the positive facts as they are before their faces and tell them what it is to come out of these facts, they will begin to think, brethren, there is more power there's more convincing power. There's more moving power in the plain direction by faith in God and the consequences of these things as a literal fact before the people than in tons of argument. You and I go with these things that are before the eyes of all people and call attention to them and show what it is in the future and tell them in the fear of God and by his grace and his power as he gives it to us, the things that are coming. Tell them by actual facts and by our earnestness and devotion to God, show them that we believe the things ourselves, and there will be more conviction than in tons of argument on doctrinal questions. And let us pre preach the message as it is today. Now I'm going to stop there. Um, well, I, I just want to, I'm just going to quickly see how much there is in this left. So. I think, yeah, we, yeah. So we have quite a bit still to go. We're not going to get through that. So, just to kind of sum up what we see here, is Jones describing our situation today? I would have to say yes. Yeah much more than he could even possibly have realized that he has chosen verses that describe the situation that has arisen with this movement's responsibility to give a message. Now, in order for this movement to give a message, 
we have to be converted. And we would have to be in unity to give that message. Why do we need to be in unity to give the message? <clears throat> Just as the disciples <clears throat> had to be in unity to give the message of the gospel so that the gospel could be then preached by those of different backgrounds, professions, and overall experience we need to be able to do the same thing because mm -hmm. we never know exactly who we're going to be able to reach or how we're going to be able to reach them and if 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 we're fighting amongst ourselves do we have any influence none whatsoever yeah yeah we have no influence i mean the power of the gospel has to be seen and the power of the gospel is in how we treat one another. And, and of course, if we really, if we were united, we would be united in our efforts. We would be using our resources in a way that allows things to become accomplished, because there's a lot that would have to be done to give the message to the world. You know, that's why Organization, and I'm not talking about that we need to make a or new organization, but organization is just order. It's things being done in an orderly fashion. God is orderly. But if I'm going to, ac to accomplish a task and every person has a different idea of what that task is and how it should be done and where the efforts are to be placed, that tax task won't be done. One person just working on his own, in his own mind of what he thinks needs to be done, using resources that if they were concerted, it was a concerted effort, um, you definitely would have a different result, correct? Agreed. And, and that's one of the reasons why we need to be united. But it's only one. The other most important is the influence that we have. And we don't realize that when we, we tear other people's characters apart, how much damage we are doing to the thing that we, ver that we profess to believe in, which is the everlasting gospel. How terrible witnesses we are, not just to those outside, but to people within the movement itself. How many people have been discouraged and left the movement because of how we have treated each other? How many people have left the Adventist church because of how people are treated in the church? That they didn't leave because they were theologically at odds with the church, but just that the church is unchristlike. And we're unchristlike not because, you know, we somehow you know, haven't uh, understood something. It's the things that we have understood we have not followed. So it's going to be quite interesting when we go into this next part because he's going to deal with the role of the church a bit more. Um, but any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the study this evening. I'm thankful that I feel so much better than I have all week. And I pray for myself and Heidi that we, we can continue to heal. And we pray, Lord, for the people in this movement. We know, Lord, that there is the stresses and struggles of this world. We ask that we can rise above the things that are seen and that we can look with face, faith to the things that are unseen. 
that we can trust that, that we are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out this Sabbath. Um, that we can begin that work that needs to be accomplished in our lives. That we can come together in unity. That this message that failed in 1893 has failed many times, will be accomplished. Be with each person. May you watch over them. May you bring us together tomorrow morning to study your word. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.